Tim Ranzetta uh, is a hero to me. And it absolutely gives me a great deal of pleasure to have him join us and share information on his uh, amazing mission. Uh, I spend my life trying to educate people and make them aware of how they might uh, invest in a way that will give them more money for their retirement. But I envy Tim because Tim's work is focused on being able to start educating at high school, junior high, middle school. And that's where the action is, folks. That's where I believe, and I know Tim believes, that there's a huge difference to be made. And so I was thrilled when Tim uh, agreed to come and speak to our organization. Uh, he's going to talk about why he's uh, started this next generation personal finance uh, uh, effort, and uh, and he is going to he's going to explain some things that I find fascinating because we have an old friend. He's no longer with us. He died about two years ago, Lou Mandel. Lou Mandel retired and he moved to Bainbridge Island for his, re for his retirement. And good fortune have it, he helped me. He mentored me to help me help others do better with their investments and their, and their financial decisions. But one of the things that Lou complained about, because he was one of the founders of the whole financial literacy movement. He complained because he didn't think that the information that was being shared with the students, the high school kids, was sticking. He wasn't sure that it was lasting long enough to have the impact that he wanted. And part of the reason was because the teaching was maybe old fashioned at some level, and maybe even the teachers weren't as aware of how of, of being significantly financially literate that made them good teachers. Well, Tim Ranzetta is changing both. As Tim will explain tonight, he has found out how you engage the kids and how you engage the teachers too. And this is leverage that I only dream about. So, uh, Tim, I'm going to let you talk about that part of your life that you want to tell them from what got you to where you are. You do have an MBA from Stanford. I know that. That's 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 great. But I think you got a lot of your uh, uh, your experience on the street. So, share a little of your background, if you will, and welcome to Bainbridge Island and to the, the world of, of financial wannabes. <laughs> Paul, I was surprised to hear the word retired in the same sentence as your name, because you are <laughs> hardly retired. And I'm going to go right back at you with you know a hero, somebody yeah. who is so dedicated and so committed. I mean, you reached out to me several years ago, and I was so thrilled because I used to read your columns um, that you would, and to learn about you know, your mission and learn about the time and effort that you put in. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jim, for, for the invitation to be with you tonight. I mean, my story starts when I was about seven years old. So grew up in a middle-class family in Northern New Jersey. My neighbor broke her hip and I was, you know, I'm the fifth of six kids. So they probably looked down and said, who's the little runt who's going to walk her dog? And that ended up being me. And the bad, there was good news, bad news. The bad news was it took Mrs. Battiston a year to recover with her broken hip. The good news was in the process, she paid me $5 every Friday and I established a savings habit. Um, walking a third of a mile to the United Jersey Bank and I was the weird seven-year-old kid who was going up to the bank tellers and dropping this $5 bill and walking home with my passbook and my father who was a banker would ask to see the passbook. And again, I had five brothers older my brothers and sisters older than me. And so that was that was the beginning of a, of a savings habit. And so I had the good fortune of having models in terms of both parents were depression era 
you know, frugality and my mom was, you know, raising six kids at home wasn't enough. So she was the perennial volunteer. There wasn't an activity, whether it was Girl Scouts or reading, reading to kids at the library, but she was just a model, a great example. Um, so I, that's my good fortune. So my path towards creating NextGen was about a decade ago. Um, those of you familiar with the Bay Area, there's Palo Alto and then there's East Palo Alto. And so I visited this phenomenal school, Eastside College Prep, um, that serves low-income, minority, first-gen students. And I visited the campus and was so thrilled at what was going on at the school. I turned to the founder of the school and said, well, how can I help? He said, well, I'd love to start a personal finance program. So, you know, I had never taught a class before. <laughs> I'd been a student but I had never taught a class, but I was like, yeah, sure, I can do it. You know, I have a couple of business degrees. I ought to be able to just find something and, and teach it. So um, what I discovered in that process of Googling for personal finance lessons was I was not excited to teach anything that was out there. So what do you do when you're in Silicon Valley? You go create something. So I built a course. It was, it was hard work. It was 25 hours of curriculum I had to develop for three groups of ninth graders. And what I saw in the process, and I was terrible. I was a terrible teacher. I tried to accomplish too much in too short a period of time. I couldn't manage the classroom, but the good news was the course took care of itself. Every kid wants to learn about money. And then the unintended consequence was parents started to email me. David came home to talk about investing. In fact, one of the things I would do on the first day of class, because you can talk about investing or you can help students experience being life as an investor. So what I would do is I'd, I'd put a $5 bill on every student's desk and we would spend 45 minutes doing a very cursory study of five different stocks, all companies they were familiar with, you know, Walmart, Amazon, Facebook, you know, we do five companies and I do very cursory, very cursory analysis. I just wanted them to, to understand what investors care about. What are growth rates? How do they make money? And at the end of the, the 90 minute session, they would have to pick one of those five stocks. And in return, I would have a stock certificate that I'd written out and I would say, okay, you are now a, a shareholder. And at some point in the next four years, cause I'm gonna keep teaching this class during the summer, you can hand me your stock certificate and I'll turn it into cash. Um, the bad news is most of them have lost their stock certificates. Um, and so that's bad news for them, good news for me, because many of those companies over the four years that they were in school, you know, probably went up four or five X, but I wanted them. And then we would discuss over the six weeks we were together, we'd look at how the stocks performed. I just wanted them to understand what investing was about. That's just one example. So two things happened, students engaged and then parents reaching out. You know, there's one story of a student who, whose father wanted to open an account. We met at the school together. He opened an account online. We went to a, a branch because he didn't want to uh, send a check in the mail. And so we opened an account and there's the son with him opening a, you know, an IRA. It didn't matter how much he put in. I knew now the dad as well as the son, there's an example there. There's a model for thinking about how do I invest in the market for my retirement? So that was then three years into teaching because I've taught that class nine of the last 10 summers. I didn't last summer because of COVID, but I started Next Gen Personal Finance. And it just, it seemed so obvious to me that this is a class every kid should take. And so we had to answer the question first of like, you know, when you have an advanced degree in business, you figure you should do some sort of landscape or market analysis. And so I wanted to figure out well, what is, what's happening in the market right now? How many kids are getting personal finance education? And so the numbers roughly today are about one in five. So one in five students attend a school or live in a state where they are guaranteed to take a one semester personal finance course. And so what's the magic about one semester? Well, I wish it was a full year because uh, there's so much to cover, um, but too often it's embedded in another course. You know, too often it's just, hey, you know, we'll spend a week or two in economics. That ought to be enough. Not nearly enough, because the way this class has to be taught to stick, to Paul's point about how do you make it stick, 
It's got to be project based. It's got to be activities. It's got to be kids going out to the internet to figure out how to do research, what are reliable sources. Um, that takes time. That's not Tim standing in front of the class with a PowerPoint presentation, rushing through and giving kids definitions, which I saw too much of. I was like, they've drained all the juice out of this class by treating it as just another academic subject when there's so much, it's much more practical, much more practical than that. So seven years ago, I had the good fortune. I'm the crazy entrepreneur with a million different ideas. And I got very lucky that my past crossed with Jessica, who's the co-founder, Jessica Enlich. So her background is math teacher, assistant principal, one of the youngest principals in the New York school, public school system, just as good fortune would have it, her husband who worked for Apple got transferred to the West Coast. And that's when our paths crossed. So seven years ago, we started it and really with a goal of every kid. It's so obvious, right? You don't meet a, an adult that doesn't say, they say one of two things. I wish I had the class. Can you teach my kids? <laughs> Those are the two things you typically hear. And so that's kind of the, the mission of the organization. I should stop talking, Paul, so you can, you can ask me some questions. Well, you know something, I, uh, I made a phone call to the uh, uh, past superintendent here on Bainbridge Island, uh, Faith Chapel. And um, she absolutely 100% agreed. Every child should have this course. So what... What is it that is standing in the way of every child having this course? Yes, yeah, so I built this organization to make this as frictionless as possible. So we're funded through an endowment. Um, so I promise that there will be no appeal at the end of this uh, hour tonight or hour and a half tonight. Um, so I wanted to make it as frictionless as possible. So we have an endowment, which means our curriculum is free. And if you have, you know, we wanted to provide anything a teacher could want. You know, you got a full semester, we got a semester course. You got a full year, we got a full year course. You want nine weeks, we got a nine week course, or you don't want a course, you just want to supplement. Well, you can get that on our website for free, ngpf.org. The second piece is we want, to Paul's point, very few people who teach personal finance have ever taken a personal finance course. Mm -hmm. They don't teach them in the ed school. They don't teach them in the ed school. And so the second piece, the second promise we made is we will provide professional development. Um, we will provide that content knowledge that teachers want. We'll provide the pedagogy, you know, the pedagogy that they're always interested in, and we'll do that at no cost too. And one of the things that's happened since March of last year is we've been doing some online professional development, online training in the past, but obviously when March of 2020 rolled around, we moved everything. And so in the past 13 months, 6,000 teachers nationwide have spent on average 25 hours a piece with us. That's like almost 150,000 hours. So we wanted to check that box, Paul. So they couldn't say, oh no, teachers aren't ready. They're not prepared. Guess what? Teachers love learning about personal finance. I'm just coming off of a behavioral finance course that I teach because that's a key element to this. This isn't a knowledge game. This is knowledge leading to behavioral change. And if you don't teach behavior, like that was one of the things that drove me crazy looking at the curricula that were out there, there's nothing about behavior. Like a lot of personal finance is going on up here and we better tackle that um, by helping students, teaching them to be introspective and think about what is their relationship to money? What are the, the things that, that are being talked about in the home? Like there's a lot of people who think the stock market is rigged. And yet there's a lot of people on this call today who say I can point to my wealth coming from that nine, 10 percent that I've earned over a 30, 40 year period, right? So we have to make sure we're, we're having those conversations uh, in the classroom. So Paul, back to your question, why isn't it happening? So they can't argue about curriculum costing money. They can't argue about professional development. So then they say things like, well, the high school schedules are really busy. Oh, you know, colleges don't, you know, we want to get kids into the best colleges and colleges aren't going to reward us for teaching this course. Um, they'll make the excuse that teachers aren't prepared. Now, teachers love teaching this course because there's not another course in the high school course catalog where if you teach it well, you're not only going to help your students, you're going to help yourself. The number of people we've taught, we've probably taught over 1,500 teachers in the last year. 
our 10 week investing or advanced investing course. They take that information and they go open an IRA with an index fund because yeah. Paul tells us that's the right thing to do. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're excited to learn this stuff. So this is not a motivation issue. Like teachers really want to learn it. So what's blocking it is leadership. It's administration. It's the principal. It's the superintendent. It's somebody saying that this is hard. This is going to require a little bit of work. My late mom had a great saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And guess what? When I have an administrator say to me, we can't do it because of scheduling. We can't do it because it's always we can't, we can't, we can't. I tell them there are 1,500 schools across the country that are not in states that require it that have done it. So don't tell me it can't be done. Why are you withholding this essential course? What I want to do is I want them to answer the question, why are you withholding this course? Because the curriculum is available for free, because teachers are eager to learn through professional development. Why are you willing to hold this back? And you know, in the state of Washington, you know, we can find schools that have made that choice. They've made that commitment. And why did they do it? Because somebody stood up and said, this is important. Somebody stood at a principal or sat in a principal's chair at, in their office and said, I'm not leaving until you get this. And we have inspiring stories of teachers spending 15 years fighting the battle. It's not easy. It's not hard. But the way you do it is you build a coalition. You get a teacher, you get a student, you get a board member. Board members have a lot of sway. You get the business community on board. And you say, this is a no brainer, folks. And then you're not just telling them you want it. You're, you're giving them a solution too. Like if anybody ever bought a textbook for personal finance, you know, that is the, the biggest waste of taxpayer money ever. Because the minute that textbook is created, it's out of date. <laughs> so I'm Can, sorry, Paul, I'm go, going on. A no, bit of no, 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 I know that. that and, and of course, I saw you guys, your group working uh, here in the state of Washington uh, at a conference. And, and as I recall, you were even subsidizing the teachers to come to the conference uh, to try to get them to take this step. And we have, I believe, five maybe it's seven gold schools in the state of Washington. And every high school in the state of Utah, surprise, surprise, is a gold standard school. But also every school, high school in the state of Missouri is a supposed to be, I believe, a gold standard school. We here on Bainbridge, we have a tremendous teacher teaches the class uh, and we are a silver explain the difference between the the gold the silver and they also ran yeah i'm going to share in the chat too for folks who might want to take a look at the map um we've so again we work with montana state university and every year because again if we're going to say every kid i want to know what progress we're making towards that goal and so if you look in the chat now and click on that, that's a map of Washington. The three designations we have, we have bronze, we have silver, and we have gold. Bronze is the low, you know, just like the Olympics. Bronze is embedded in another course. Now, the unfortunate part is research finds about two thirds of the time, what's embedded in a course isn't taught. So again, if I'm teaching economics, I already feel like I have so many standards I have to teach to. I run out of time. What do I run out of time teaching? Didn't have time for personal finance. Although I will tell you, we meet a lot of renegade econ teachers who are like, my class says econ, but I teach personal finance, but don't tell anyone. And I think that's a surprise to a lot of people. If it's not a high stakes course, if they're not testing at a state level economics, when that teacher closes that door, they often teach what they want to teach. And if they feel like personal finance is going to have greater value, then they will. So that's embedded. That's bronze. Silver is an elective. So at least students have access to an elective, whether there's a lot of sections with that elective, but that's a start. Because the way this typically goes is you start with an elective. The teacher feels more confident. The teacher has a curriculum they're excited to teach. And then word spreads. 
and one section becomes two, becomes four, becomes six, and then suddenly it's a much easier sell because, hey, half the graduating class took a personal finance course. Why can't we get the other half across the line? So that's silver. Gold is a one semester standalone personal finance course that every student is guaranteed to take. So I'm very careful about the words I use because you'll often hear folks throw around terms like mandates and requirements. And when you hear mandates and you hear requirements, it sends shivers down the spines of superintendents and they love to be able to say no mandates. Don't give me, so I like to talk about guarantees. Why can't we guarantee that every young person crosses the graduation stage having taken a one semester personal finance course? And I suspect it won't shock folks to find out that the number of low income children from low incomes families uh, have very little access uh, to the kind of information that would, um, we're looking for ways to create equality, equity, uh, a financial education is a huge step, I would think. In fact, you've done enough looking at this. What is the difference when a student has been exposed to this? What is the difference in that child's life? Because you get them at the high school level. So I guess you could probably see some theoretical impact at the college level. Do you see that happening, kids who go through the, uh, that process? Yeah, so there is more and more research. So, you know, there was, there's still this belief that kind of swirls around academia and the ivory tower that, oh, this stuff doesn't work, right? And a lot of those studies are really old. And I always like to say, you know, we've only been around seven years. So um, let's see some more current studies because I think we teach this course in a very different way than the way it's been taught. I think we've invested more in teachers. Like when we looked at market share over the last year, 90% of teachers who had done professional development had done an NGPF professional development. And so wow. that means like I, I tell our team often, if we don't do it, who will? And so I don't really place a lot in those late earlier studies, but the good news is that even the studies that are coming out today. So if we find that folks who are exposed to information about high interest loans, i.e payday lending are less likely to choose high cost options. Maybe they're choosing payday lending because they don't know what other options are available. Or maybe no one's ever given them uh, a banking simulation so they can learn how to manage an online bank account. So they're not getting $35 overdraft fees, which is like a $10 billion business for banks. Um, so high interest loans, we know if you talk to students, and, and this is a real problem, and this is where, where real investment should be made, this decision of what young people are gonna do after high school. You know, it's probably the biggest decision that they're gonna make. And we, when we think about financial capability, you know, are you gonna go off to a four-year school that will get you a higher salary, but if you don't look at the I part, you know, return on investment, you can get a high return. The question is how much you're investing. Are you aware that out of state public schools can sometimes cost as much as private colleges. Are you aware of all the various ways that you can pay for your education? Did you learn that the importance of getting a job while you're in high school, right? One of the things that's really disconcerting is when you look at, I think half the number of young people have jobs before they leave. Half the number of young people have had a job before they leave high school, right? That part-time work, anybody who worked when they were in their teens, for me, it was, I was a golf caddy for eight summers and that kind of paid my way through school. Anybody who knows that first job is so critical. Um, it might've been at minimum wage, but boy, you thought about money a lot differently. Um, and then all the other things you learn about what's on your paycheck, um, taxes and the like. Um, so anyway, I don't know how I got here, Paul, but we were talking bronze, silver, gold. Yeah. Um, I put a link in the, in the chat. So again, we do a report every year, the state of financial education and the numbers in lower income communities or communities serving black and brown students, you know, it's one, it's one in five nationwide, but in those communities, it's one in 13, one in 14. And so one of the things we're addressing is when we, when we looked at the numbers rural versus suburban versus 
urban is that there are in large urban districts that they're financial education deserts. So we could walk into the district office, Paul and I, we could knock on some doors and say, who's your personal finance specialist in the district? Crickets, you know, we think there's about two of the top 20 districts have somebody. If you don't have a champion, if you don't have an advocate, if you don't have somebody who's a specialist, it doesn't happen, especially if it's not, you know, and, and those large districts are so hard to move. The bureaucracy is stifling and they're focused on standardized testing, not on electives like personal finance. So one of the things we've done is we've said, okay, well, we'll create a grant program. It's called Financial Equity and Empowerment. And we'll provide three-year grants to pay for that personal finance specialist. We'll do it for three years because we want the community to buy in. So after three years, we hope the business community steps up, sees the value of this. So our first two markets are Miami-Dade, which I believe is the third or fourth largest district and Milwaukee. And the third is actually, uh, the third is Prince George's County, which is really important. Prince George's County is in Maryland. It's a majority minority district. And the district last year said every student. And so we said, we want to help and make sure this implementation is successful. And so that's a great signal because you know, you can look at those top 20 districts, they don't have personal finance specialists and they don't have this ethos of every student needs to take a personal finance course. So what about, what about people who would like to access all this fine work that you've done for their own family or, or maybe uh, at the, oftentimes at the church, they'll have a, somebody who will, will teach uh, and homeschooling, of course, is another need. Um, what do you do with people like that? Yeah, I mean, so our our website has a lot of content on it. So people will often say, okay, where do I start? What would be useful for, for me as a parent? So I wrote a blog post and I'll include it in the chat. And I always think, you know, money is taboo. If you have too much of it, you don't want to talk about it. If you don't have enough of it, you don't want to talk about it either. And so money's taboo, often not talked about at home. And so I always say like the natural times to talk about money are those milestones that young people have. So it's the first job. Well, they get, the, they get a pay stub or they get direct deposit. Like, let's take a look at, let's look at that together. You know, when they're really young, you're opening a, an account for them, a savings account. And I always like, especially if they're, you know, 10, 11, 12, um, now this has changed a little bit. It used to be you had to go to a bank branch to open an account. You know, I always feel like let the young person drive the conversation. And the most important decision they need to be aware of if they open a checking account is do they want overdraft protection? And it just opens up a window to a conversation. Oh, let's take a look at the fees, right? It's something, no matter what financial product you talk about, we ought to be talking about fees. And so before you make them an authorized user on your credit card. Well, we're gonna look at the Schumer box and we're gonna look at all the costs that come with credit cards before you give them the keys to the car, right? When they turn 16 to get their license, hey, let's go look at an auto insurance policy. Um, if they earn money during the summer, boy, what a great gift for parents and grandparents to match. You know what? You earned a thousand dollars this summer, I'll match you. One of, my dad was brilliant about these little contests he would have, you know, he would take you know, the refund he got from the, uh, from Uncle Sam. And that was like, that was match time. So it wasn't dollar for dollar, unfortunately. Um, but there was an incentive there. And, you know, what a great gift to give to your children or your grandchildren to get them started. Because that money that they're, you know, you all know the power of compounding interest, that IRA you help set up for them. And when they're 15, 16 years old, boy, they're going to thank you long after we've left the planet, um, they will be very, they will remember that, that impact. So let me find that blog post. The blog post was 10 money milestones um, for so, parents who wanna teach their kids about money. And so what I've done there is I've highlighted the milestones and then I've pointed you to resources and activities. You know, we created something, you know, we always tell people read the fine print, but then we don't teach them how to do it. And so one of the things we have a, a product we call the fine print, and it literally is, you know, we're not going to dumb it down. We're not going to give you the light version. We're going to give you a rental agreement because before you rent an apartment, you ought to know what's in it. 
We're going to show you a credit card statement. We're going to show you a, you know, a brief um, checking account agreement. And then we're going to ask you 10 questions about it to make sure you really, you really understand that. So I just put a link to the blog post uh, in there. Um, yeah, so it's opening a bank account, first job, keys to the family car, the importance of budgeting. You're thinking about college. We have games too. Like we're big believers. Uh, we're big believers in kind of running simulations or having students play games. And we've, we've got this great partnership with a digital ad agency that's built eight of our games now. And they're just really good. They're not an ed tech company. They're like, because they're a digital ad agency, they know how to engage. Um, so they create these games that really evoke strong emotion while also having a really uh, creative creative uh, element to them. So, so, so give us an example, Tim, of a, one of those games and the emotional lesson that kid is going to learn and probably not forget. Yeah, so my dream is that every young person will play a game we call Payback. And I'll put a link in the chat and you can kind of play around with it while I talk. Um, so the, the brilliant insight the game developers had when it came to Payback was, it's a game of helping young people get to and through college. So if you're a first time college student, or even if you're not a first time college, you don't know what you don't know. And so the game starts with young people putting in their GPA, um, whether they wanna go private or in state and then extracurricular activities. So right there you have a conversation. Oh, if I'm a junior, if I'm a freshman in high school, like why does this stuff matter? Oh, it actually goes into whether you can get into the school and whether they're gonna give you merit aid. A lot of people are surprised by the fact um, private schools on average discount tuition 50%. Um, they don't call it discounts though, because they can't, they call it merit scholarships. Um, but okay, I digress. So we get into the game, you've made those choices and then you pick a college and then you go through and make probably 30 to 40 decisions and you go from freshman year to sophomore year to junior to senior, and you're making decisions like, what are you gonna do for a summer job? Are you gonna work as a lifeguard? Are you gonna go find an internship? Every decision you make impacts four things. One is a student loan meter, student debt meter. So your decision that you wanna uh, go out to eat with friends on a weekly basis, your student debt's gonna go up, but the other, three meters in the game are happiness, focus, and connections. Happiness, focus, and connections. And so if you optimize on student debt, like, oh, I'm gonna keep that student debt as low as possible, you're not gonna graduate because one of those meters is gonna get run down and you're gonna drop out. And we now have enough data, over a million people have played the game, 70% graduate. So 30% fail. The beautiful thing about the game is you get to play again and you get to try different strategies. And the power of the game, the game is great, but we have a worksheet that goes with it. And I did this with a school, these were actually freshmen in college because it's valuable there because they don't know what they're about to experience for the next four years. And I did it with a group, Paul Smith's College in upstate New York and there were upperclassmen in the room. And the conversation that followed, you know, we, we, we did a group game where I'd post something, a question up on the board, a decision that had to be made. And I'd kind of say, okay, well, what do people want to do and show of hands? And then we talk about that decision. And it's, it's that conversation that's, that's really important. And then the game ends with, you picked a major and we have data to suggest, okay, if you pick that major, here's the average salary. We, we're now going to look at what's your average salary and what's your monthly salary and what's your monthly student loan payment? Because I asked somebody who was over their skis when it came to student debt to the tune of about $80,000. And I said, what would have made a difference? What would have made you think twice before you went down that path? They said, if I knew $800 a month was coming out of my paycheck to make that student debt payment. Yeah. So my hope is with that game, it, it does, and I'm, I want to get, ultimately, I want to get a research study done because you talk about impact. 
I'd love to have that game played in junior year spring or senior year fall before students apply to college. And then I want to see, you know, do a randomized controlled study and then go see what decisions they're making and what their student, like what's that decision they're making in the spring and expected student debt, you know, some sort of analysis to say, does this get them to think more about that decision? Because the hardest part about college is it's not a rational decision, hmm. right? You walk on a college okay. campus, you say, I want to go there. No parent wants to disappoint their child. We'll make it work. And they have these dangerous things called parent plus loans, where guess what? You as a parent can borrow no credit check or minimal credit check. You can borrow up to the cost of attendance. And so they actually put that in the financial aid award letters. And so they get the numbers to balance. Here's the cost. Here's how you can do it. But the plug figure is the $30,000 parent plus loan. So is it uh, possible for you to pull up, uh, I happen to look at checking uh, and to see that page that talks about, well, it's got cartoons, it's got uh, games, it's got all sorts of things that uh, theoretically any of us, if we had kids at home or grandkids, uh, could pull up that particular page uh, and go through those those uh, those same topics. Are there are there parents that are doing that that you know of, or is this pretty much just teachers using the site? Yeah, it's a good question. We don't. I don't have a great answer for that. Um, we've seen in the last year a lot more homeschool. Definitely a lot more homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't, I mean, to be honest, the, we haven't targeted the parent market. And frankly, part of it has to do with just the makeup of a small nonprofit. Um, so yes. you use the term earlier, leverage. Like, so people often say, well, why don't you just go direct to students? And I can tell you, I've seen so many folks with the best of intentions say, we're gonna target st students, consumers, everybody wants to learn about money. And the unfortunate thing is they don't like given a choice between Instagram or watching a video or playing a game about money and nah, not so much. Um, and so our strategy of going direct to teachers was intentional because I know if we do a good job, both providing the curriculum that teachers want and providing that training, they reach 100 students on average mm -hmm. and they reach those students year after year after year. So it's tremendous leverage. Um, versus parents, bless parents, I'm a parent, um, but that's a one to two, yeah. one to three ratio. Yeah. Um, and so we're not, we're just not geared to kind of do that. Now, you know, parents who are enterprising, parents who want to dig in, they can find, as you said, you know, you go to our website, ngpf.org, you go under curriculum, and the first thing you see is units. And there's 12 different topics you're all familiar with checking, um, credit, managing credit, um, types of credit, investing, and you click on one of those boxes and you see kind of, okay, here are all the resources that NGPF has. And, and the question of the day, I, I do open the question of the day daily. I enjoy your questions of the day. And what I found interesting is it, 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 keeps, it keeps the teaching they're doing very current. I mean, when crypto is, is in the news, you're doing crypto. <clears throat> you did GameStop. You, you, you've done things that I think are making those kids and keeping those kids involved. And, and that's pretty cool. You have to. You have to. And it's, it's great because we have this, this community of teachers is just phenomenal. So there's a, there's a Facebook group that we have called Finlet Fanatics, 6,000 teachers in there. And they're just so giving and so collaborating. And, you know, a teacher will put a request up there. I'm teaching this course or the, I'm teaching this uh, section next week. Anybody have any ideas? They'll get 20 responses, 20 thoughtful responses. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been incredible kind of the level of um, sharing that's taken place because for most teachers they're the only one in the building who cares about personal finance so now we kind of they feel like they found their tribe well you you also have uh, 
stuff for math teachers. In fact, is it Math Friday? No, what is it, math? Well, we, we had Math Monday. And math uh, Monday. yeah, the, the funny thing about question of the day is a friend of mine whose father was a lifetime educator one time just in passing was like, yeah, my dad had this hook. Like he'd come in every day with a different question and kids would really love it. And so that got me started. You know, when you're starting an organization, you're starting a company and you want people to return to your website. Well, you got to give them a reason to come back. And there's nothing better than like, hey, can I come up with a question? So I was like, ah, we'll get this thing started. So every day on our blog, we post a different question. Now I feel like I'm the Cal Ripken of questions of the day because I think five years running every day during the school year, yeah. You got to come up with a different question. I got to yeah. tell you, sometimes it's 10 o'clock at night and I'm oh struggling, <laughs> uh, but I have, I have my favorite sources to, uh, to go to. That's, that's great. So let's talk specifically for a second about Bainbridge. Uh, when we talked on the phone, uh, you gave me some idea. If you have a, a school of 1300 approximately students, uh, if, it, if everybody has to take this course, uh, about how many full-time teachers it takes. What it, uh, to try to give us some sense of, of what that cost is. Yeah, I mean, so here's the math. Um, so if it's 1300, say it's 450 per class. So you basically every year, you know, again, simple, I'm trying to make a simple example here. 450 kids are gonna cross that graduation stage. So every one of them has to, has to get the course typical class sizes. I don't know what it is in Bainbridge, whether it's 20, 25, or 30. Let's just take uh, maybe 25. So we're talking 450 kids, 25. That's 18. I think it's 18 sections. Um, so you need 18 sections. Typical course load, I think, for a teacher would be, I don't know, four to five. So say it's four, but you're going to teach two semesters. So that's four each semester. That's eight per teacher. You know, two teachers, two teachers, maybe two to two and, and a half. And something has to be taken out of the curriculum. What comes out? Yeah, I mean, most high school curriculum have electives built in, right? Like not every class that you're required to take, not every credit is accounted for. Like there might be, there's electives built in. You have to take a certain number of math. You have to take a certain number of, um, social studies, right? And then there's typically this elective category. So that's where you typically find it. Um, you will find, I actually, I don't know, and I should have checked this prior, um, about half the states require economics. And so the other approach we've seen states take, like Arkansas, is they've said, let's let the market decide. We have an econ requirement. Let's just change the law to say econ or personal finance and let the market make that decision. Arkansas is one of the fastest growing personal finance education that's states. Um, Cause given the choice, I think so, that's- So yeah, you're okay with that as well. It's and a start, it's a start. Like I always, you don't want, uh, what's the, the phrase about perfect being the enemy of good or good, yeah, good being yeah. the enemy, perfect being the enemy of good. Like I want more access and that's, that's gonna build over time. And yeah. so give me a, give me a, Give a teacher a foothold in a community. And so, so we're going to include a link to this recent Who Has Access to Financial Education in America Today uh, in the footnotes of when we archive this. Uh, and in there is a list of all of the high schools uh, that, ha that are. Uh, are they all the high schools in the gold high schools? Gold standard high schools. Gold yeah. standard. Um, and some states, I mean, are huge. I think we have five gold standard high schools. Uh, and and that is interesting. Richmond, Richland is one. Montlake Terrace is one. Woodway, Edmonds, Woodway is one. Um, and and I, it'd be interesting to know how those all happen, but I am curious about all of those schools across the nation. How many approximately of those schools is your curriculum in today, approximately? Yeah, so uh, one of the most important meetings I had uh, was when I got NGPF started, I thought I'd go visit the superintendent um, 
here in Palo Alto, right? Pretty highly ranked, very similar probably to Bainbridge. And because I wanted to see like, is the strategy I should be going after districts or going direct to teachers? And that one meeting was the most valuable meeting I think I've ever had because it quickly became apparent. If you want to go through districts, it's a long, arduous process. So we kind of, we literally have built this organization one teacher at a time. So we're up to about 45,000 teachers nationwide, none of whom teach our course because they're told you have to use NGPF. Our best source is word of mouth. So in terms of coverage, you know, if I look at each of those teachers and map them to a school and map that to student population, it's basically 70% of the high school student population has a teacher that uses NGPF. That's great. And so your, your recommendation to us is get to know the board, get to know the superintendent or find out what they feel about it, get to find the, find the teacher who's got the passion. Yep. And, and then typically how many years does it take to make this happen? <laughs> so let me give you a best case scenario. Um, we literally had, this is a f great story. So we were in New York uh, one summer and we used to, you know, prior to COVID, we did in-person. In fact, we've done in-person in Seattle. We call them fin camps. So we rent out a conference room at a hotel. We, did, we had a really nice hotel in Seattle, actually. Um, and then we invite teachers and we do a full day, 50, 75 teachers. So we did one of these in New York. And one of the, one of the guys there, his first name was Mark. He was actually in the district office. So usually we don't, we'd love to see more district administrators show up for our training. It usually doesn't happen. So Mark shows up and he's on fire after this. And a month later, he's calling and saying, we're, you know, wow. I'm pushing this through. We're going to be gold standard. Right. And it shows you like, if you can get, find somebody on the board who has a business background or who's in, involved in finance, it's a no brainer for them. And then as they, cause I think it's the fear of the unknown. Well, what curriculum am I going to use? Who's going to teach it? How are we going to pay for it? Like, you just got to knock those out one at a time. But if you can get support at the, you know, when I told you there was a teacher in Swampscott, Massachusetts, took her 16 years. She said, I just, you know, it took five different principals. Mm. And eventually I found the one who, who wanted to get it done. But the higher, if you get a superintendent who says, I want to do this, it happens quickly. Um, but if you're, if you're not getting that high level support, you can't get the meeting with the superintendent or they're telling you this isn't one of our focal points or we need to do X instead of Y. Because, you know, schools have a lot of, you know, you're not the only one at the table asking for personal finance. Somebody's probably pushing for civics. Like mm -hmm. civics is becoming more and more mm -hmm. critical, but there are other programs that are very deserving. So this is not, you know, there's a lot of people trying to get to the table to say, hey, this, this should be taught in the schools. But I think it's building a coalition. I think the struggle with teachers often have is it's one against the world. <laughs> and students do a great job of, you know, they just are very authentic in their desire and their description of what they get out of the course. You know, teachers obviously are really important to say, guess what, I can do it. I wanna do it, I wanna do more. Um, parents, uh, business community, folks in the business community, and then, you know, community members. And it's hard to say no when you got a room packed, you know, at the board meeting. And they're like, how many people did you bring to this meeting? Like, yeah. what's going on here? And I think the key is you got to have a solution. It's not just we should have it. It's like, okay, and let me tell you how it can get done. And let me tell you that there's 1500 schools in the country that have already figured this out. And there's schools in Washington, you know what, I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to figure out what's happening because there's a virality effect to this too. Because when your district gets it, Bainbridge is incredibly well-respected in the state of Washington. Guess what's going to happen? People will notice. Yeah. People will notice. And, we, and the, the research shows, you know, we, we actually had Carly Urban, the researcher from Montana State who did our report. Um, she went and looked at the network effect and it's about 7% more likely that you're gonna have personal finance if, you, if your neighbor has it, your neighboring district. Well, we have some work to do then. Uh, we know you don't want our money. 
Uh, is there anything other than making an effort here in our community that uh, we can do to help NGPF? Yeah, I mean, so we, we have focused on grassroots and you know, at some point we wanna get more involved in top down. So here's another stat, you know, you always need, you need glass half full kind of things happening if you're an entrepreneur um, and you're trying to solve something that has, you know, stymied a lot of people along the way. So this spring, well, this winter and spring, in the last three months, 25 states have introduced bills to increase access to financial education. So again, there are five states that currently guarantee it. There's two additional states that are in the process of implementing it. But so of the other 43 states, 25 of them thought enough about this issue. Now, I have gotten a civics lesson in the last month um, in terms of the distance from a introducing a bill to getting the governor's signature. And so we thought we had one in Kansas. You know, it passed through the Senate, it passed through the House, it got to the governor's desk, and they vetoed it. Um, wow. Because, and you see this, you know, we're a nation that believes education is local. And so there is this natural tension that always exists when it comes time to the legislature telling the Department of Education that you should teach this course. Um, it just, it happens. And that's, that's, you know, so if you ask kind of how, how could I help, it's for those who are politically engaged, it's Washington was not one of the 25 states. It's getting somebody, and you know, frankly, even if the bill doesn't pass, guess what? People are talking about financial education in Kansas, right? It's top of mind. It's bringing advocates out. So we've had the opportunity to speak at hearings on behalf of, you know, on behalf of these bills to talk about how important it is. So, and it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, but the thing I'm just constantly reminded of when people say like, this is a fool's errand, Tim, like, come on, like mission 2030, are you kidding me? Like this is educational bureaucracy. All I can, all I can think about is, you know, Kennedy said, go to the moon. And we did it eight years later. This ain't rocket science, right? This is not <laughs> rocket science. This just is the imperfect, you know, imperfect human race who is, you know, who I think, you know, this is, I think it's, we're seeing the signs that this is the beginning of a movement yeah. because of people like you, Paul, like the more I tell you, there is not a, a day that goes by where I'm not getting an email from somebody I never met before. Who's like, I love what NGPF is doing. How can I help? And that's, that's how it's going to happen. It's going to be a bunch of crazy people who just don't take no for an answer who are like, this is really important to me. Um, so important that I'm gonna devote my life and my efforts to make it happen. And I'm just inspired every day. That's great. And we have, you have a little while, take a couple questions from Please. our Please. viewers. And Jim, have you been checking on the chat there for, for yes, our I questions? Have. I have. And um, so there's, they've actually come into a few different uh, categories. So first is around grade appeal. So um, where, what is your, what are the target grades that your curriculum focuses on? Yes, yeah, so I always say the sooner the better. We started with high school because I thought it was the last mile problem. Like huh. I knew there were people who were heading out into the world. You know, one of my prior entrepreneurial ventures I was involved in um, was focused on, uh, it was called student lending analytics. And so I was trying to help families around this issue of financial aid. And I would get calls from parents and students at all hours of the night, they thought I was a lender. I wasn't a lender. I was a, uh, an analysis or a consulting shop and they'd be in tears. You know, every story was just heart wrenching. I'm a sophomore, I got 70,000 in debt, you know, or the, the parent who's, you know, they're taking out the parent plus loans. And I said, wow, this is a national emergency here because all we keep doing is tallying up the student debt, but nobody has an incentive to teach young people the dangers of it. Because guess what? Colleges don't care. Colleges will cash the checks and the default rates, you know, so there's this thing called the cohort default rate. And if a school, if the students at that school default at like 40% or higher, and but 
the defaults are captured in the first two years and there's ways it's just it's a big game when you actually dive into it it's just a big game and nobody has an incentive you know we talk about financial literacy on college campuses and paul i know has fought hard at western washington but i would have conversations with financial aid offices who'd say eh, do we really want to teach kids that this isn't the best investment for them <laughs> are you kidding me like seriously in unguarded moments yeah i would hear stuff like that yeah. and so I wanted to attack high school first. We now have a middle school curriculum. You know, I think when you're teaching literacy in elementary school, like why can't we talk about Aesop's fables or, you know, we can talk about money then too. Cause I, I, the sooner the better, we all know that these habits, these attitudes form pretty early. So I think the earlier, the better. Now there are some who say, well, you know, you should sprinkle it throughout the curriculum. I just think that's really hard to execute on from a, from a district perspective. There's some people like, oh, you shouldn't focus on just on high school. Like you should sprinkle it in all these other courses. The problem is sprinkling doesn't work. Sprinkling doesn't happen. You don't invest enough time as an educator if you're like, oh, we're only doing a week of personal finance. It's just, ideally you would do that. I just think it's really hard to execute, which is why we're so fixated on a course in high school. Yeah. I'm curious, just a side note there, with PLUS loans, um, those are kind of, I mean, there's credit cards that get better deals on the rates than plus loans do, aren't there? Plus loans are, uh, I want to say I haven't somewhere between five and 6%. Okay. So yeah, they're not parent plus loans. When you consider that kind of, they don't really have a credit, uh, check element to them. I think unless you really have a derogatory, um, uh, derogate, you know, derogatory marks on your credit, you can pretty much borrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, other questions around technology. So um, you shared with us that, that, cool, uh, that cool resource. How, um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned in using that technology about you know, the, the best methods and you know, how it is, how it is uh, best to speak with young people? And also curious if you have um, any examples of like things that just kind of lit lit like fire uh, uh, in, in terms of the educational tools you're using? Yeah, so I'll start with the second question first. So I think the games, the games are a huge hit. So I think we're on a, um, and these, these numbers are not big to game developers, but they're big to education game folks. I wanna say our arcade, so there's eight games in there, there'll be over 5 million plays today. And so uh, we have a game called Stacks. So we wanted to build a game, and Paul will appreciate this. Um, how can we create a game that teaches students the value of index funds? I mean, let's face it, the best investing is actually really boring. And yet all kids wanna do is trade GameStop all day. So we create this game called Stacks. It's 20 years of invest investing in folds in 20 minutes. And so it has everything young people would wanna have. They can day trade you know, five different stocks and the stocks are changing all the time and they're competing against their friends. And it's a frenzy of act. And I love leading these like, um, so they're playing independently, but the scoreboard's up on the screen and I'm kind of shouting out like, oh my gosh, look at Paul, Paul, what's your secret? You're winning the game now. And the, the you know, just exactly what kids want. And in the background, they're competing against the computer. And so they're making all the choices and then the computer's there. And so again, about 80% of the time the computer wins and the kids are like, well, what happened? What's the computer doing? The, the computer's doing the most boring strategy ever. They're dollar cost averaging into index funds. And so it's just a great entry way into, because the problem with, you know, one of the most popular games in high schools are stock market games, right? And what gets lost in the stock market game, if you ever Google how to win the stock market game, that's not how to win the investing game <laughs> because what do you do? You buy biotech companies, you look for penny stocks, you're looking for volatility because the game lasts about one month. And then what also gets lost is the, the percentage of kids who walk out of that saying, I'm not an investor. I came in last, right? Or I came in the bottom half. And so, we, and then we lionize the winners. Paul's a genius. He won this one month contest and nobody wants to tell the young man that, hey, you were lucky. Like there's really no skill involved. And so, you know, I was surprised when we got in the game, nobody was teaching index funds. Like literally I would walk into a room with a hundred teachers and I'd, I'd ask, 
how many of you are teaching your students about index funds? If I got five people out of a room of 100, I was happy. And so that was like a huge thrust for us. And so that game, I think, is gold because there's an important lesson at the end when students kind of reflect on the fact that they were doing all of this stuff and they could have, there's a much easier way. Are you going to be the best investor? You're not. But can everybody follow that strategy? That's the other thing. I want every young person to leave the classroom believing they can be an investor because there's never been a better time, right? There's commission-free trading, right? You can buy fractional shares. The minimums are low. Like there's never been a more accessible time. Now, the problem is there's not a lot of education out there. So you have people jumping into things like GameStop. Mm -hmm. How do you, what are your metrics like in terms of how do you, how do you know when something is working or if, if kids are actually using the knowledge that they have? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, it's, and I don't have you know, the research into this is really hard, right? Cause we can do longitudinal studies and let's track these kids, but you know, I tend to live in the real world and recognize there's a lot of influences <laughs> So what I hope, and you know, probably what we should, we should be asking teachers more, more so is I'm interested in ac actions that young people are taking. So I wanna know how many kids when they entered the class had a bank account and how many had it at the end of the, the session. I wanna know how many kids thought about or looked up their credit score. If they're 18, they can pull that down, right? Versus when they started the class. I wanna know attitudes. Um, I think ultimately my measurement in a lot of these is I think teachers know pretty well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and if teachers are recommending your product, then they're seeing something in the classroom um, in terms of what kids do. So I'll, I probably don't have it. And that's, you know, frankly, one of the benefits we have of having an endowment is, you know, donors are always hitting on evals, evals, evals. And I think most of the evaluations for financial literacy are garbage. Because what they do is it's a pre and a post test. So it's all about knowledge, right? Okay, so you didn't know anything coming in and you learned something coming out. I can pretty much guarantee you, no matter what curriculum, you're going to have a 30 point improvement. Just it's the nature of things. So what does everybody do? Look at all this gain in knowledge that people have. You know, we will do a gold standard study at some point. Um, but I want to make sure that we've invested the time in professional development so that we're confident that this is being taught by a highly qualified teacher. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think the state of play right now in, in financial education in terms of um, how people measure results isn't, isn't great. Great. Thank you. Um, other questions around um, the, wh whether or not you've ever worked with uh, anyone who's not a school district. Um, yeah, I mean, so we have, we have homeschools. Uh, we have a lot of nonprofits, yeah, a lot of college access organizations um, will, will come. So prisons, you know, juvenile detention centers, um, they, have all, they all have their own challenges. In fact, I'd love to meet somebody who's doing work in that area because I would love to be able to get more, you know, there's obviously challenges there because they're not, you know, oftentimes it's gotta be off computer. So you have to kind of figure out, you have to kind of work in the environment that's currently there. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. There is some, you know, somebody in Iceland, you know, we have people all over the world that just show up, you know, Oren from Iceland, you know, he's second career banker, just really passionate about this stuff. Went and got his education degree after like a 30 year career in finance. And now he wants to go create the NGPF equivalent in Iceland because he's really passionate about it. Like I got the best job in the world because <laughs> folks who are in this space are, you know, there was somebody from New Zealand in my behavioral finance course yesterday. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's the neat thing about this subject is that um, you do see, um, you meet some really interesting people from all over the world. And the lessons are applicable outside the US as well. Yeah. 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 And and Tim, let me just uh, quickly ask, are you saying that any of us, if we sign up appropriately, I don't you don't know. need to sign up. That's the beautiful thing. The only 
everything on our website is entirely accessible with the exception of answer keys. And so we keep a pretty, you know, believe it or not, we have verified 46,000 teachers because students want access to it. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so with the exception of answer keys and many of you are, you know, financially adept and would be like, I don't need those answer keys anyway. Um, but yeah, everything's, we wanted to make it as friction frictionless as possible. But your psychological, the behavioral uh, course, think that would be interesting to the average person who is interested in that kind of a topic? Are we going to get, are we gonna get 71 people from Bainbridge <laughs> signing up for my course? Um, I mean, we have, we don't have capacity constraints. Um, if that's the question, it's occasional, you know, I'm just amazed at the number of people who attend these and then go, um, you know, go start up. Like there's a, Carolyn Cooper is a teacher from San Jose or not a teacher. She's a volunteer in San Jose, wanted to get in the schools. And so I know many of you talk about wanting to volunteer in schools. Um, it's hard to get into schools. Like I have an older brother who's retired, who's dying to help out in Missouri. And he's found it really challenging. So what I find, what you find is people find a place where they can plug in. So there's a tax program called VITA, V-I-T-A, you know, helping low-income people with simple tax returns. But this Carolyn Cooper from San Jose, like she decided to create a course, online course, and she's teaching, you know, kids in the neighborhood. Um, so cool. it's That's always cool. exciting. I think people get inspired by others. Yeah. That's great. Excuse me, Jim. Well, yeah, I think um, next question is just so so in terms of access, every anyone can access all, all of the, the tools and games and things like that, correct? Yeah, and it's you know, the courses are scaffolded. I mean, the lessons, think of our lessons as playlists. So we're typically curating, you know, we start every lesson with a discussion prompt because kids have to start talking, like putting kids in front of computers and saying, here's your financial literacy course, that does a disservice to them because you have to have those conversations. That's what makes it, you know, peers learning from peers um, is so critical. Yeah. So what would you say, um, you know, to the, to the retirees or the school district parents or, you know, those folks that, um, that are on this call that, that feel like they, they want to help advocate for this at a district level, what would you say are their first steps? Yeah, I know that, you know, I'm sure there's some very well connected people here. And I think you want to go as high anybody who's got a relationship with the superintendent start the conversation um, and feel them out right you want to you want to know what the hurdles are ahead of time and you want to, you know, you want to kind of cultivate them the way and anybody involved in sales knows you don't want to go too hard too soon. Right, but you want to kind of build you want to figure out where they stand, first of all. Um, and you know if it if the principal of the high school is amenable to I mean, you would just be shocked at how easy it is if you can find the right person, the higher up they are, the better um, to support an initiative like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're like, you know what, we're getting, we're getting the Heisman, you know, we're getting blocked at every turn, then you then you build from the bottom up and you build that coalition. Um, you find, you know, whoever's teaching personal finance today, you know, they're going to be a they're going to be a key resource, you know, find out from them. Oh, you know what? There's a wait list. I can only teach one section, but there's a wait list of kids who want to take the course like that. Those sorts of stories matter. Um, but again, it's happened 1500 times. That's why, you know, when people say this isn't going to happen, I'm like, there are now more students getting personal finance because of grassroots efforts than because states are top down saying you have to take a personal finance course. And that's, that number is only going to, it's doubled. The number of gold standard courses, number of gold standard schools has doubled in the last two years. And this is in the middle of a pandemic, for goodness sake. You know, the fact that the, the momentum is there. That's terrific. That's terrific. So this is a question that may actually be more aligned with Paul, but um, Tim, you mentioned this as well. So, you know, we, we advocate, Paul's been a big advocate for um, parents uh, opening up an IRA for, for a a child as soon as they possibly can, as soon as they get that first paycheck, and um, and hanging on to that for for the rest of their uh, the rest of their life. 
one of the, um, the, the question is, you know, that makes it, that's, that's fine for kids that work as a dishwasher at the local restaurant, um, harder for kids that are babysitters or that are doing something non-traditional. Um, do either of you guys have any uh, stories or are you aware of any sort of ways that, um, that parents have been able to, to do this for their kids when they've, when they've been a little bit more on the non-traditional side? Yeah, Paul may correct me here, but my understanding is that as long as you document, like if I'm a babysitter and I'm getting paid in cash, I put on, you know, June 13th, the Joneses, $30. Like if you document that, my understanding is that that's, that's fine. Like take that amount of money and that's the amount you can put into, in, you know, into a Roth IRA. Paul? I'm right? absolutely, absolutely right. And I had... Uh... One of our uh, people that follow our work sent me a picture of their six-year-old son uh, mowing the grass. <laughs> and it was and and he had a hel he had a, a helmet on, a cracked helmet on, and he's and he's paying him and uh, and he's getting the IRA. And so yes, it, it's absolutely work on the house. You, you better talk to your accountant if you're going to talk about how, how you use uh, whether whether you pay for those individual jobs as opposed uh, to a and here's one of those moments at 77 where you can't remember the word but somebody there is going to say you dummy the word is allowance I got it I got it. Uh, I'm not sure an allowance counts. I don't think it does. But if you paid them for those jobs specifically, I believe it does. Probably has to be a market rate too, Paul, right? <laughs> no $1,000 uh, lawn mowing jobs. That's $1,000 an hour. I think that's, I think you're right. That's right. So Tim, I'm curious, what's ahead? What's, when you look at the, um, when you know, you've been in this work for a while, you're seeing these uh, gold, more gold standard schools uh, uh, come online as you've, are there, is there a nut that you are still waiting to crack or is there a, um, is there a new frontier that you'd like to expand into down the road? Oh, you're on mute, Tim. You'd think, you know, I would figure this out by now. Um, I love the, um, I love the Hemingway quote gradually and then suddenly, cause I think that's what we're going to, what we're going to see here in terms of the, the momentum. That's picking up. So where are we going? We're gonna um, we're not gonna sit around and wait for you know schools and states to decide on financial education. Guess what? There are math courses being taught in every high school in America. So our next big push is financial algebra, because there's a growing recognition in districts across the country that the traditional algebra one, geometry, algebra two, and then pre-calc is for everybody. So we're starting to see more folks say, you know what? We ought to have more flexibility because the kid who struggles in Algebra 1 is not suddenly going to be excited to take Algebra 2. So we're starting to see some states say, you know what, a course like Financial Algebra can be that third or fourth math required math course. So there are Financial Algebra books already out there. The problem is they're math focused and they don't get the finance right. So they use, you know, they use examples like in savings accounts earning 10% interest or they talk about compounding, in, they talk about stock market interest. Um, they get the math and they're too focused on the algorithms of doing the math and not enough on the financial concepts. So I think that's what we can bring to the equation. So I think um, by the fall, I mean, we're actually staffing up with math specialists to kind of address that. So math is one piece. I think the other is economics. You know, half the states in America require an economics course. So we'll, create more personal finance activities that you can plug into an economics course because we don't want to wait. The other, the other thing we just announced last month was um, we got a mission 2030, but we, now we have a mission 2025, which is 30% of high school students don't have access to an elective course. So we better get there by the middle of this decade to put us in position. Now that seems to be an easier lift. And you know, each of these grant programs, we give money to schools to recognize them and to encourage them. So if your school does not have an elective in personal finance and you add one, we'll give you $1,000 and we're going to 
you know, we'll do that for a thousand schools. So that's a million dollar grant program. And then gold standard, if school makes the commitment that every student will get a personal finance course, it's $10,000. And, you know, that money is to be used not for the school, but for the personal finance program. So um, that's kind of, that's kind of where we're going. And uh, it's, you know, for the first time in a long time, I, I think you, you know, I am more confident than ever that kind of we've, we will keep improving and we will keep iterating, but like the curriculum piece, no, we've got the most comprehensive set of curriculum out there. Are we going to add to it? Yeah, we're going to do a bunch of behavioral finance this summer and we'll keep on, you know, in touch with trends. With professional development, we can scale that. Like we can put two or three times the number of people into our sessions with no, you know, dim, no diminishment in terms of quality. And so we can train 20,000 teachers. If the state of Washington tomorrow said, you know what, we're going to make sure every school has personal finance, I'd raise my hand and say, we will train every teacher in the state of Washington at no cost. Like we can do it. We have a model that works. Um, the piece that, you know, the big missing piece now and that we, I will fight for to my last breath is advocacy. You know, how do we get, how do we get this to every student and, you know, treat it as the social justice issue that it is. Uh -huh. Have you met anybody uh, in your travels that, that uh, thinks they know the way to get to how do you get to help all of those low income children, children from low income families? Has anybody thought of a, of a special? I mean, schools are, schools are a special place. Like people say, why schools? Well, if you want to reach every kid. Yeah. That's the place. So that's where, it. Yeah. That's where they're at. Yep. And I think I, yeah, I think, you know, there are programs that work through churches. Mm. Um, you know, John Hope Bryant, uh, runs a program, very successful program. And I think he focuses on nonprofits. Um, the Schwab Foundation does work, great work with the boys and girls clubs across the country. So I think you do see people kind of saying, you know what, we'll let Tim and NGPF fight the battle in the schools. We're going to go around because we know we can get faster, you know, faster implementations, but I'm playing the long game here. So, um, I don't have to worry about fickle donors saying, you know, hey, you're not making enough progress or um, we're going to play the long game here. That's great. Any more, Jim? That's it for me. That's it. Tim, thank you. You are a jewel and uh, we will find ways to help you here on Bainbridge. One thing I'm going to do, I'm going to call the teachers, at the schools that are gold schools here in Seattle. I mean, in the state of Washington, and find out what happened, how they got that way. And they're not all high-priced schools. There, there are some that I would suspect uh, it, it it was an uphill climb to get it in. So, we'll I think, do what yeah, I we think can. I'm guessing you will find, in almost all instances, it will be one person who, yeah, wouldn't stop. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and all that you're doing for the youth of, of our country. It's a big deal. And when you, you know, they, they talk about how uh, there are so many billion dollars wasted each year that people overpay in fees in the mutual fund industry. What they don't ever do is compound that money for the rest of those people's lives. Yeah. So it's not a few billion. It's many hundreds of billions. So uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Are you Thank gonna you. invite me to your beautiful island, Paul, when you guys get this requirement at Bainbridge High? Cause oh, you got it. I'd love to be there. Cause you got it. We will I, have a I, party. I, my my <laughs> trip, trip to Bainbridge was a gorgeous summer day. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, oh how nice. Stepped off how the nice. ferry, a beautiful quaint downtown. Yeah, it was a gorgeous day, so. Well, keep up the good work. And Jim, thank you very much. And this is the last of our series. Uh, and I really appreciate the help from Library U and Bainbridge Community Foundation. And, and uh, we're going we're gonna to be asking you questions about what you want for next year. So uh, don't throw my letter to you in the, in the circular file, please. I want to I do this every year.
help uh, Cambridge, and I think Jim is committed to it, and I, I think Library U is as well. So uh, stay tuned. We've got lots of good stuff coming. Good night Ver to you I see all. One, one question here. I see one yeah. question from John asking, uh, if students could do this on their own, and I, I, you know, I think with an adult kind of looking over their shoulder, kind of putting together a course, or, I mean, it is, I think it's possible. Like in this case, they're thinking about the scouts and, um, and, you know, please reach out to me. I'm Tim at ngpf.org. If you're like, Hey, I'm thinking about putting together a program. Can you point me into what are the best resources you have on XYZ topic? So I should have I should have mentioned that earlier. And we do know you're up at 10 at night doing the question of the day for the next day. <laughs> yeah, if you so. have good questions, uh, <laughs> let me know. I, I tapped into the 2020 census um, the other night. <laughs> that, that has a lot of implications for uh, financial futures, doesn't it? Huh? Slow growth, slow population slow growth. growth. Yep. Yep. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks, right, thanks. to everybody. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, thanks everybody for joining us tonight.